The objective of this topic is to identify the causes and corrective control of weld and weldment distortion. Arc welding, gas welding, and most other forms of welding involve the application of heat to metal. Heat from the welding causes metal to expand. It takes time to be conducted from one part of the metal to another part, reduces metal strength at high temperatures. If the heat source is removed, the metal will contract to its original size if it was not deformed when in the hot condition, cool to original temperature, regain its original strength. This combination of conditions can cause distortion. If we understand how each of these properties work, we can better understand distortion. First, we will consider expansion. Heating causes metal to expand. Cooling causes metal to contract. The change in size is in all directions. A one inch cube of steel will expand a very small amount in all directions if heated one degree Fahrenheit. This amount of dimension change per inch of size for each degree of temperature change is called the coefficient of thermal expansion. Each type of metal, such as steel, aluminum, and so forth, has its own coefficient of expansion. An average value is generally used. For aluminum, the coefficient of thermal expansion is about twice that of steel. With all of those zeros, the amount of expansion doesn't seem to amount to much. It couldn't be measured with a micrometer, which is accurate up to about the fourth place. Let's consider a 10-inch cube of steel. Since the cube is 10 times the size of a 1-inch cube, in length, width, and height, the dimensions will increase 10 times as much for each degree of temperature change. Still not very much. If the 10-inch cube is then heated an additional 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit, the change would be 1,000 times as much as for a 1 degree increase, 0 0.067, which is a little over 1 16th inch. If we remove a 1 inch by 1 inch by 10 inch bar from the cube, we would find that after the 1,000 degree Fahrenheit heating, it would measure 10.067 inches in length. For aluminum, the bar would lengthen a little over 1 8 inch. Metals have another property related to heat. This is the rate at which heat will travel through the metal. This is called the rate of thermal conductivity. This rate, like the expansion coefficient, is about the same for each metal, but varies greatly between metals. For example, it is 26 for steel and 117 for aluminum. The nature of this property, as well as the variation between metals, is easily demonstrated by holding identical size pieces of steel and aluminum in a flame. It can be seen that the heat takes some time to travel along both pieces, but travels much faster in the aluminum. Change of strength. When metal is heated to a high temperature, it loses strength. This graph shows that steel actually becomes a little stronger up to about 500 degrees Fahrenheit, but loses strength sharply as the temperature increases. The strength loss due to high temperature at the puddle is regained quickly as the air and surrounding metal lower the temperature. With the surface metal at the point of weld being liquid, some of the base metal is heated to 1500 degrees Fahrenheit, where the strength of the steel is extremely low, making it subject to deformation. Expansion, conductivity, and change of strength combine in a rather complicated way to produce distortion. 
If we examine some simplified illustrations, we can have a better understanding of the combined action. In order to better see the dimensional changes, they have been exaggerated. Change of strength and expansion. If we uniformly heat a bar of mild steel up to 1500 degrees Fahrenheit, it will become much larger and lose much of its strength. If we do not deform it while it is hot, the bar will return to its original size and strength as it cools to room temperature. If we repeat the heating process, but this time hold the bar between two fixed surfaces, we cause interaction between expansion and strength. The bar will try to expand in all directions. Since the fixed surfaces prevent increase in length, all of the expansion of volume must take place in width and height. The width and height increase by the amount of thermal expansion plus the amount caused by plastic flow of the weakened metal. As the bar is cooled, it shrinks in all directions. Since there is no side force to reverse the plastic flow, the bar will be shorter than it was at the starting temperature. The volume of metal returned to its original amount. Therefore, the width and height are greater than the original amount. Expansion and loss of strength resulted in distortion. Expansion change of strength and conductivity. To illustrate how conductivity enters into distortion, we will use the following example. We know that we can heat one end of a long metal rod in a flame and hold the other with a bare hand. The longer the rod, the longer we can hold the end without being burned. If the rod is long enough, the temperature at the held end may never rise above the hand temperature. That is because the thermal conductivity of the rod will not let the heat flow along the rod to overcome the cooling effect of the long rod surface. If we hold a long rod between two fixed surfaces and apply heat to the middle portion, the temperature of the rod may be 1500 degrees Fahrenheit at the flame and room temperature at each end. As before, the heat causes the bar to try to expand in all directions. With the end movement prevented, the bar must expand by getting fatter by plastic flow and thermal expansion. The still strong end portions of the rod will only expand in proportion to the temperature change. When the heat is removed, the metal shrinks in all directions. With no external force to thin out the deformed section, the length of the rod will be less than the original amount. Expansion, conductivity, and change of strength have combined to produce distortion. Another example of distortion caused by change in strength, expansion, and conductivity can be illustrated with a thin, flat steel plate. If a high temperature heat source is passed along one edge, it will melt the surface metal and heat the metal under the surface up to 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. A short distance farther from the edge and all the way to the opposite edge, the metal will be at room temperature. The metal in the heated edge will expand in all directions. The unheated part of the plate does not expand. The plate will bend somewhat due to the pressure of the expanding metal. The unheated portion resists bending and puts pressure on the heated part. This pressure on the weakened expanding metal causes metal to flow and thicken up the hot edge. As the plate cools and contracts, the thickened edge regains its strength and becomes shorter than its original length because there is no force to reduce the thickened edge to its original dimension. This produces a curve in the plate in the opposite direction. With an aluminum plate, the action would be similar. Distortion would be less because the conductivity is higher. Heat would flow rapidly toward the opposite edge, causing it also to expand and apply less pressure on the heated edge. 
These same actions, change in strength, expansion, and conductivity produce warping of a plate when a bead of weld is laid along its length. The deposited metal is momentarily at a temperature of about 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit, slightly above its melting point. The base metal immediately under the bead is also melted and fuses with the deposited metal. In cooling, the molten base metal freezes and cools first, followed by the lower portion of the weld bead and then by the remainder of the weld bead. At the moment of solidification, or freezing, the metal has little strength. It is expanded due to the temperature. As the metal cools, it gains strength very rapidly and also contracts in all directions. This makes the top surface of the plate slightly smaller and results in warping of the plate. The rate of heat input which is directly related to conductivity, has an effect on distortion. When welding a butt joint between two narrow and relatively thin plates, the joint opening may open farther, close, or remain constant, depending on the welding current, travel speed, and conductivity of the metal. Experimentation is the only way to determine what will actually happen. A single pass fillet weld used to make a corner joint will tend to warp the plates and also change the alignment of the plates. The deposited weld metal becomes an integral part of both plates as it solidifies and cools. The weld metal rapidly gains strength as it cools and contracts. As the weld metal contracts, it rotates the plates toward each other to produce a smaller angle a multiple pass fillet weld will be subject to the same action, resulting in additional angular change for each pass. A single pass V weld will respond to the forces by pulling the plates out of a flat position. A multiple pass V weld responds in the same manner as a single pass V weld, except that each additional pass adds to the distortion. Also, the wider the V, the more the distortion, since there is more metal to contract. From these examples, it can be seen that distortion always occurs during welding operations. The general type of distortion can be predicted. However, it is next to impossible to determine how much distortion there will be until an actual weld is made. A combination of things can be done to minimize the effect of distortion forces. Consider the example of the inside fillet corner joint, which distorts by decreasing the angle between the plates. One solution. Estimate the amount of movement and angle the plate in the opposite direction so that the weld will pull it into alignment. Another solution. Use a T-type joint if the design permits. The second weld tends to reverse the distortion caused by the first weld. The second weld should be larger than the first because it must pull against forces from the first weld. For additional passes, continue to alternate sides of the joint for each new bead in order to keep the distortion forces equal. For the V-groove butt joint, first keep the V as narrow as possible to reduce the amount of weld metal. Or start the weld with the parts offset in the opposite direction of the expected distortion so that the distortion forces pull the parts into line. For thicker pieces, when cost of preparation can be justified, weld alternately on opposite sides. Symmetrical parts, such as an I-beam, are subject to less distortion because the distortion forces can be balanced. The flanges are the same size and the same distance from the center, also called the neutral axis. Also, the welds are the same size and the same distance from the center. 
The forces of Well 3 and 4 try to bend the web in one direction, and Wells 1 and 2 try to bend the web in the opposite direction with the same force. If all the wells were made at the same time, the forces would cancel out each other. Or, if wells 1 and 4 were made at the same time, followed by 2 and 3 made at the same time, it would be almost as effective. If made one at a time, the order should be 1, 4, 2, and 3. A box beam is another example of symmetrical construction with forces from each well being balanced by a like force on the other side of the center, or neutral axis. Equal distortion forces acting from a fixed distance from the neutral axis can be compared to a balance beam with equal weights at equal distances from the pivot point. As long as they are centered and use equal forces at opposite ends, the forces cancel each other, much the same as distortion forces. Another way to reduce warping is to use intermittent welds. The less welding, the less warpage. Backstep welding will reduce warping. The weld is done in segments by making a series of short welds started from a forward point and welded toward the rear. Each small individual weld will have its own small distortion force, which will have less effect on the whole piece. Heat sinks to remove the heat as quickly as possible will minimize distortion. They can be large bars of highly conductive metal or bars with passages in them for circulating water. In large parts, such as tanks and decks made up of a number of pieces, make welds in a sequence that will minimize distortion. It is best to make transverse, across, welds first, followed by longitudinal welds, lengthwise. Where possible, clamp the article in fixtures to minimize distortion. In summary, heat of welding causes distortion due to forces build up from a combination of metal characteristics. Expansion and contraction, change of strength and conductivity set up forces which distort metal. The design features of the weldment influence the action of the forces. Metal thickness, overall size, overall weight, placement of welds, type of welding. By understanding how distortion forces act, a welder can minimize distortion by keeping the forces as low as possible by intermittent welding, balancing them against each other, by using restraining fixtures or many tack welds, by using heat sinks for fast cooling of wells and presetting the workpieces.